Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Let's consider for a moment the transformation presented by this biblical fast. Jesus goes into the desert a carpenter, fasts for 40 days, and returns from the desert as the Christ. The story does a good job of illustrating the transformative powers of fasting, but you know there's a real good reason why fasting is transformative, and it is explained in the process called autophagy. Autophagy means simply, in the Greek it means self-eating. In essence, autophagy is how the body renews itself by eating itself. Japanese researcher Yoshinori Asumi won the 2016 Nobel Prize in Medicine for describing how autophagy works to renew the body. In Food Chain 1192, we learned from biology professor Richard Vierstra that Asumi's discovery has turned the world of biotechnology on the possibility of managing autophagy with drugs and how tens of millions and perhaps hundreds of millions of dollars are being invested in figuring out how to speed up or slow down autophagy. But there are some but there are some people who say we do not need drugs to manage the renewal of our body through autophagy. Today we manage autophagy ourselves. But how are we going to do this? By fasting, of course. And here are some people who are going to help us walk the, our way through fasting and finding our way to this marvelous process by which we can renew our own body. We're going to start with Dr. Daniel Pompa, who was a healer a teacher, and the author of the forthcoming Beyond Fasting. Dr. Dan, welcome aboard. Yeah, thanks for having me. I love this subject. Well, you've been working with this subject for quite a while. When we last talked, you taught us the principles of detoxing our cells, of which we have trillions uh, of cells to be fed and kept happy all the time, because that's what we're made out of. And uh, you really did a great job of bringing that whole world to us. Um, and now you're working on us, going to teach us the, about the process of autophagy, so we're really looking forward to that today as well. Also with us, we have Dr. Duncan McCollum, who also is a healer, a teacher, and a proprietor of McCollum Cal- Family Chiropractic in Capitola, California. Welcome aboard, Dr. D. Thank you very much, Michael. It's a really a great honor to be here with both you and uh, Dr. Pompa. So, Dr. Duncan, you have a, are a classically trained chiropractor, and you, through the years, you've really become a nutritionist as well as a chiropractor. Yeah, and, you know, as uh, Dr. Pompa states, it's pain to purpose. And, you know, when you are doing something and, you know, your body needs help, oftentimes you have to go searching to heal yourself. And through that, you, you really reach out and find these miracles that happen. And when I first met Dr. Pompa, it was, you may not know this, Dr. Pompa was a few years ago at CalJAM, a big chiropractic uh, convention. And uh, Dr. Pompa got on stage and started talking about not just um, intermittent fasting, but ketogenic diet, ancient healing strategies, all these things to help the cells get healthy. Mm-hmm. And he said one magic phrase, fix the cell to get well. And I was enthralled with what he was doing. And then I saw a good friend of ours, Dr. Mindy Pell, walk up to him, give him a hug, and went into the back office with him. And I went, I want to do what he's doing. <laughs> so that was my introduction so, to Dr. Pompa. So it, we may as well establish some lines here. Uh-huh. Dr. Duncan McCollum is my teacher because I just finished a seven-part seminar with him um, uh, on this subject. Mm-hmm. And Dr. Pompa is your teacher. Absolutely. So that's the line of communication here. So why don't you introduce Dr. Pompa, because he's your teacher. Awesome. So uh, as I said, I met Dr. Pompa a few years ago, and Dr. Pompa um, will tell his story, which I think nobody else can tell as well as him. But, um, you know, he is a chiropractor by trade, and through a certain course of events, he found himself at the bottom of his health. 
And uh, again, I one thing I can tell you about in being in practice for 30 years, I've had a lot of mentors. And most of those mentors were like, if you looked at a pyramid, they were at the top of the pyramid and everything got taught down to them. One thing very unique about Dr. Pompa is he's at the bottom, the pyramid's upside down, and he's there at the bottom opening up the world to us. And it's like Dr. Mindy says, so great. It's like being hit in the face with a fire hose all the time when I talk to Dr. Pompa and you teach us because, (laughs) you know, that machine I just bought you introduced a month ago and you just keep telling us about more stuff. And it's, it's like unbelievably fun to work with you. Yeah, yeah. Well, I didn't know it was so painful. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Didn't pain to purpose. That would be a lot of pain. pain well, inspired. wait a minute. You know, with respect to you chiropractors, the good ones, you always seem to come out of pain mm-hmm. or discomfort. Am I wrong? I mean, you always seem to have faced some kind of serious crisis and found your way out of the, those crises with chiropractic. Pretty much that you, you learned a lot of it yourself. Yeah, I think that's the case for most chiropractors and probably most healthcare professionals. I know a few chiropractors that just thought it would be a good idea and they became great doctors too. So, but I think pain to purpose has to come in along the way to really motivate you and keep you. Uh, Yeah, when you go against society and the the normal way of acceptance, uh, usually pain to purpose is you know what gives you uh, you know that stamina and it gives you that drive and it gives you the purpose and the mission when you have your own story. There you go. And you certainly have one of your own. But I'd like to start with the whole notion of of this whole process of autophagy. I often think of it as the fountain of youth. Uh, Because as long as we've been on Earth here as human beings, we've been looking for this fountain of youth. And we always seem to be looking for it in the wrong places, uh, looking for love in all the (laughs) wrong places. You know, we're running around in the Amazon or or in the Amazon or in the Florida Everglades. And have you seen the fountain of youth? (laughs) No, it's nowhere to be found. We look for it in drugs and never can find it there as well. But lo and behold... It's inside of us, is it not? Yeah, I mean, there, see, therein lies the mistake, is they're looking for something to take from the outside in. And when, you know, really, it's that innate intelligence that God has put in every one of us. And I always say, uh, you know, all we can do is really remove that interference. And, you know, the body has a, a, a way of healing itself and living longer healthy. I mean, our, our genes are programmed for much longer than we're actually living. And, and put it this way, you know, it, it, we're definitely programmed better than the last 15, 20 years of life being ridden with diseases of degeneration, all right? That's been very normal now in this country, in many modern countries, uh, but it, it absolutely is not the way God designed us. So the better way of saying it may be common, but it's not normal, actually. So the, the fact is, is that healing ability is within us. So instead of looking out here to take something, really it's, it's in us. I think you have a very good example of that in your son. Would you relate that story to us? Yeah, I uh, have yeah, pain to purpose. Uh, yeah, there's, there's seven of us behind me in that picture. Some of you can't see that picture because you're on the radio. Um, but all of us have quite the story. Um, my oldest biological son uh, recently, in the last, uh, well, about seven weeks ago, uh, decided he would go cliff jumping and jumped off a cliff. And um, unfortunately, he didn't see an out cliff about 50 feet down. So instead of hitting the water, he hit that on his heels and then square on his butt, and it fractured his spine severely. I put it this way. 75% of the people with this fracture end in paralysis. Um, and, and honestly, when you look at how he hit it, the doctor said, well, you should be dead. Uh, so he should have been dead. He should have been paralyzed. He was neither. Um, but they recommended this really horrific uh, surgery where they come from the anterior. And I did some research. I just said, give me 24 hours so Daniel can make, he's 21, Daniel can make a, uh, a logical decision, not an emotional one. And I have to say, at first I was leaning towards the surgery, but then the doctor said, well, we don't know if all the ligaments are ruptured, but with this fracture, we, they always are. Uh, so the fact was, is we ended up doing an MRI, and, and some of the ligaments weren't, in fact, ruptured. So we opted out of the surgery, and the doctor said, look, 
We'll do an x-ray uh, about two, three weeks from now. But, Daniel, don't get your hopes up. I, I doubt that that kink is going to hold. It's going to get worse. And, and I'd have to say this. I, we, had t we had tens of thousands of people pray, and we did that x-ray. Not only did it hold the, his body weight, uh, but the kink came out, and uh, the doctors were stunned. Uh, the bones were already magically healing. Um, you know, we were doing a lot of things, and I can take credit for a lot of those things, but the king coming out, I'll give God the glory there. But the machine that uh, you mentioned, um, Duncan, Dr. Duncan mentioned, uh, is one of the things that we're using, um, the stem surge TRT device that helps the bones heal faster. Well, we hear that your son decided to fast his way through this process of healing. He did. He fasted the first five days. When they were trying to give him food, he knew instinctively uh, you know, no, I'm not going to eat. I'm not even hungry. I'm going to listen to my body. Fasted for five days, and then uh, he started eating. Um, he started getting hungry, ironically enough, and that was the body's sign that, okay, we can start to actually feed the injury. But the fasting, again, it, it drives up this process of autophagy where the body was getting rid of, rid of all the inflama inflammation, the cells that weren't helping the process of healing, and then around day four, day five, the body starts upregulating its own stem cells to replace these cells. And we saw this massive uh, improvement just in that week of fasting. And he was able to move and do things that they thought were impossible for him to do. They say that, that autophagy is the process of good cells eating bad cells. And what do they do with the bad cells? Yeah, well, you know, when you look at fasting, the body needs a certain amount of nutrition to live. It needs a certain amount of uh, protein uh, to repair and heal. But where does it get it from? It gets it from the bad cells. The body's just so smart with its innate, inborn intelligence that it knows not to go after the good cells. It literally will go after the cells um, with bad DNA, the cells that aren't uh, behaving properly, that have lived too long. We call those senescent cells. And we don't want those cells. So what it, what it does is it's smart enough to get those cells and literally eat them and use it for energy and use it for healing. And then here's the best part. It doesn't just get rid of that cell. It stimulates a stem cell, which is basically you know, how our bodies heal. I mean, this is where we start, stem cells. They're neutral cells. They have the ability to become any cell in the body and reheal. So it triggers a stem cell and recreates the very cell it got rid of. And now we have this young, healthy, that's not doing the wrong thing. Wow. Right. So when you jump off a cliff and land wrong, fast for five days and let your body heal you know, itself. Animals do it instinctively, don't they? They do it. That's right. Folks, that's we're right. going to take a quick yeah. break, but when we come back, we're going to talk about stem cells and autophagy and how our body can heal itself with Dr. Daniel Pompa and Dr. Duncan McCollum. And you, do stay tuned. We will be right back. Welcome back. This is the Food Chain Radio Program. Today we're talking about how the body can heal itself, or has for as long as we've been human beings on this earth. The process is called autophagy. We've only recently figured out how that process works, and today modern medicine and the drug companies, Big Pharma, are spending tens of millions, hundreds of millions, to figure out how to make drugs to either speed up autophagy or slow it down. But here today, we have two doctors uh, who are going to tell us how we can go about managing our own autophagy. Is that a fair summation, Dr. Pampa? Can we do this ourselves? Uh, absolutely. The body's designed to do it. Uh, listen, I, certain people with certain conditions, no doubt, I would say, you know, fast with supervision. Uh, but there is no doubt 
that our bodies are designed to fast. You know, you were talking about your son, your 21-year-old son who jumped off a cliff and landed wrong and, and healed right away. They did some fasting, they had a magic machine that you worked with him. But wow, it's easy to heal when you're young. Well, but something happens along the way, and we quit healing so well. And as we grow older, we start picking up these weird diseases, like Alzheimer's and, and heart disease and this and that and this. What's happening to us as we grow older? Is it just aging? Yeah, I mean, uh, studies show uh, we start to lose viable stem cells. So that means we have stem cells, and no doubt the number of them drops. However, the viability drops. So we have stem cells that are in a dormant state, if you will. And when you fast, you're able to wake up those stem cells, and they start to wake up and start to look for that what, that what needs healed again like a young cell. So there's partly the fact that we create new stem cells, but part of it is waking up our dormant stem cells as mm -hmm. well. Now, I kind of got there with the help of Dr. Duncan McCollum's class at a point where uh, where we were in autophagy and we our bodies were making stem cells, and I could feel it. Is, is, that, is that possible, or was I just imagining that, Dr. Pompa? Yeah, I... No, you're, no doubt. I mean, you'll have certain things, like maybe it was a knee injury from uh, 20, 30 years ago, and all of a sudden, literally, you feel that knee aching. That's the healing process, and that can be the autophagy and the stem cells uh, working in that area, literally driving the healing. You know, with every fast, I, I have different things that will heal, and I will feel the magic of the autophagy stem cell process at work in our bodies. And so you're right, you actually can feel it. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk a little bit about, um, this is something Dr. Duncan covered pretty clearly with his seminars, is that um, we're in trouble from the start. Before we even step outside of our mother's womb, we're in trouble. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what we know, there's a lot of studies that are showing that, you know, what, seven, four to six, seven generations of of toxins come down through our mother, through the umbilical blood. And, you know, we come into this life already with a bucket that's somewhat full. And some of us have bigger buckets and some have smaller. So our tolerances are different. And then when we're born into a world like this, that there's 82 thousand chemicals made since yeah. world war ii or something like that we're bombarded constantly with these and if our body's able to detox them correctly through um, the liver and the in the kidney and our various detox pathways we're healthy but what happens because of our diet and this is what i've learned from dr pompa so much is you know and and you know this from the food we eat we get inflammation we and then we start to lose our vitality and we get sick there you go. And one of your favorite chemicals that we're often passing on to the next generation um, is glyphosate, Dr. Pompa. Yeah, glyphosate, it's uh, the number one, uh, it's the active ingredient in Roundup, which is uh, the number one pesticide herbicide used on the planet. Uh, yeah, I mean, research. Um, all the way back, I remember an article that I read from uh, Stephanie Seneff. She's a senior scientist uh, from MIT, 2012 study. And she showed that this chemical glyphosate is allowing chemicals that we're already exposed to, even from utero, to, to Dr. Duncan's point, like heavy metals, like mercury, lead, aluminum, to cross from our body deeper into our brain. And she believes it's leading to Alzheimer's and dementia, diabetes. I mean, she, she goes on to a list of different conditions that glyphosate is leading to, but it, it really, it's, it's leading to part of the problem. It's opening up our protective barriers like our gut. So when you open up this gut, and it uh, creates a condition called leaky gut. Now that leads to more autoimmune and food allergies. So would you explain leaky gut? I've heard a lot about it, but what exactly is it? Yeah, so this chemical glyphosate, it will we'll say it goes in and it affects the bacteria of your gut, which can create inflammation of the gut. So if you think about like a pipe with holes in it, right? Okay, that's a leaky gut. It's oversimplified, of course. Uh, there's even areas called pipe junctions in the gut that are meant to open and close to let nutrition out and white blood cells in, etc. And it leaves those gaps wide open. So that's also leaky gut. The problem is, 
is that protective barrier left open is now allowing di uh, proteins undigested to cross into the bloodstream where your body builds up antibodies and that creates inflammation and unwanted symptoms and the other protective barrier is the blood brain barrier so does uh, Stephanie Seneff's point it opens up the blood brain barrier and allows these other toxins like heavy metals to cross deep into the brain and now we're seeing an increase, massive increase in dementia, Alzheimer's, neurodegenerative conditions. Now, has anybody explained to you from conventional medicine where all of these new diseases that used to be rare are, why are they becoming so common? Has anybody actually put this on the table and said, well, this is what's going on? Yeah, look, uh, you know, when you look at the literature, we know environmental chemicals and you know, chemicals that we're exposed to every day from our food, these silver fillings that so many people have have 50% mercury. I mean, you know, Dr. Duncan pointed out we're getting that in utero from our mother. I mean, it's everywhere, right? And, but yet it's being ignored. When you go to your doctor and you say, uh, they say, oh, you have dementia, or they give you a diagnosis of autoimmune, uh, truth be told, they themselves believe that you're just unlucky. Oh, you have cancer. Mm, you're just one of the unlucky ones. Look, I've been blessed enough to go to a part of the world and visit one of these last hunting gathering tribes where they didn't have names for diseases that we have because they don't exist. And one of the questions that was asked to me, why don't they have disease? You know, they barely eat. Well, they practice the art of fasting, this tribe. They eat pretty much one big meal a day. So they fasted daily. And of course, they were Actually, at this time, when I right the first time that I saw them, they were forced out of the high mountains because of a drought, which they were fasting for quite some time. Uh, our body is designed to be in fasting states, and it resets our bad genes into turning on good genes and turning off bad genes. It helps our gut and our microbiome that we know is 70% at least of our immune system. All these amazing things happen during fasting states that our ancestors were forced to do and today we have to be taught to do. Where do we store all of these bad things that we're exposed to? How does our body yeah. store them up? Yeah, I mean, they, they're stored in cells, in particular fat cells. Uh, toxins love fat. It's attracted to it. And uh, unfortunately, one of the things that we see is when people lose weight, they rele release toxins because they're not doing the proper detox. And then that stops weight loss, and it dysregulates their hormones. And they oftentimes feel worse but they end up in weight loss resistance because of the toxins released from their cells. But ultimately, they get in and around our cells. And one of my sayings, and Dr. Duncan uh, will tell you this, is we have to fix the cell to get well, but more specifically, we have to detox the cell to get well. If we don't upregulate what these cells were naturally meant to do, and that's detox the toxins out of them, now we have cells that are building up toxins. Bad genes get turned on. Cell functions decrease. Which, is, which is the diminishment of autophagy. Now, that, that's exactly right. Now we start creating more bad cells. Oh, and we're not fasting to get rid of the bad cells. So now we have these cells that are damaged, living too long. Of course it leads to cancer. Of course it leads to dementia. Of course it leads to just simple brain fog, um, you know, lack of energy, not feeling well, reaching for every you know, thing from more coffee to stimulants to whatever it is. When the fact is, is what a growing group of us, like Dr. Duncan and myself and, you know, many others, docs that I'm training, we're detoxing this, the body at the cellular level, but we're also putting these ancient healing strategies to practice where we're forcing the body, you know, into this healing state by removing the interference and then using autophagy and stem cells. The body knows what to do. How did you come to the... Uh, to have this epiphany someplace along the line about at uh, autophagy and and fasting um it, it must it must have just struck you one day it's like yeah. oh what? it's a great question actually i you know i became fascinated with fasting in the 90s this guy herbert shelton uh i started reading his books and he had fasted thousands and thousands of people and I, I couldn't put it down. And then I went, I found fasting clinics. I would literally go to these clinics and I wanted to know everything that they know. Back then, nobody was into fasting. I, I was a lone wolf amongst some weird people that knew about fasting. Eating 17 <laughs> times a day, you know, the rest of us are eating 17 <laughs> times a yeah, day. Right, exactly. I would believe me. No one was interested. Today it's in vogue, thank God. Um, but, you know, one of the criticisms then was, oh, fasting's no good. It lowers your immune system. 
Well, why would they say such a thing? Because they would see this massive drop in white blood cells during a fast. That was true. But all we could say was, look, I, that may be true, but all I can tell you is bad immunity gets turned off and good immunity rises and people heal. That's all we could say. Now, scientifically, fast forward, uh, some recent studies, and maybe it's why people are now interested in fasting, have shown that the reason for that drop in white blood cells is the body's literally through autophagy is eating these hyperactive bad cells that are causing food allergies, food sensitivities, autoimmune, where the body's attacking itself. It's getting rid of those, so that is the drop in white blood cells. These bad cells is what we're seeing the drop in, but what we didn't know then in the Nobel Prize, the gentleman, the Japanese gentleman you mentioned, 2016, he showed that we're replacing these bad cells with good cells via stem cells. So now, you know, we understand what's happening in a fasting state. So my interest has been rekindled with the science. And it seems like everybody's interest has been rekindled by Yoshinori. Or no, Osh Osh yeah. How do you pronounce it? Yoshinori Asumi. Is there you go. <laughs> yeah, All right. That's what I say the Japanese scientist. <laughs> the Japanese scientist, yeah. It seems like everybody is caught on to this, this magic of autophagy and and the biotech people are going oh my god look what we can do now um mm -hmm. and so they're in throwing tens and hundreds of millions of dollars at this process yeah. looking to speed it up or slow it down if if you can control it with a pill wow what an amazing thing that would do but you don't need to control it with drugs because you point the way of of doing it without drugs. How did you come by this process that you've developed, um, which we're going to go through here? Uh, how did you develop this process to lead us through this 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness with Jesus, I guess? Yeah, yeah. Um, I assure you it's come from a, a lot of self-experiment, but because I teach you know, hundreds of doctors, we're able to experiment within a group. Uh, so, you know, you read something in the literature, but that doesn't mean it actually works. So, you know, I'm good at reading literature, but then I'm better at taking things into practice. And then as a group, we say, okay, this is, tr you know, transformational. Uh, this is working. So, you know, in my, my new book called Beyond Fasting, we bring people up to a fast. Uh, Dr. Duncan in his clinic is uh, really uh, probably more so than anybody. Though. We have a program called Stenomics, which really is about what the book is about. Which is the process I went through. Yeah, exactly. It's about going up to this fast. So when you do, in fact, fast, you get the maximum autophagy. We even have a way of testing for that that you can do yourself um, in the maximum stem cell um, uh, you know, put, uh, output and generation. So it, it's, a, it's an amazing process that we discovered over time. But, you know, to your point, though, you know, people are trying to control this autophagy. But here's the magic. That innate intelligence that's in your body, it knows when to gear it up and to gear it down. It knows what it needs and how much. Every fast is a little different. The body's innate intelligence knows. So by just pushing the body in a state of autophagy is not wise at all because it may not want that at that time. It may want more stem cell production at that time. The best part about fasting is the body knows exactly what it needs when and how to do it instead of man coming along and saying, we know best. I'm going to make you into the state of autophagy. Fasting, it doesn't work that way. Your body gives exactly the amount you need. Which you know, is the, the far big pharma way of doing things is we're going to force you to do this. You're, yeah. and We're going to force the plant to do this. We're going to force this. We're going to force everything. I want to chime in for a minute here because, you know, there's so many um, – different things happening, like the ketogenic diet's really popular and fasting's really di uh, popular. But one of the things that Dr. Pompa's not mentioning is those things by themselves aren't going to get you where you not need to go. And one yeah. of the brilliance of you, Dr. Pompa, is you've put together so many different things, like the intermittent fasting with the ketogenic diet, teaching us how to move in and out of ketosis. You've taught us about uh, the cellular healing diet and diet variation and all these things like ancient healing strategies and how to detox a cell. So we're doing all of that that nobody else is doing. And they're not going to hear this from a guy who's just doing keto or just doing intermittent fasting. And it, all of those things are, are control mechanisms. When you say keto, mm -hmm. keto is a way of controlling 
what's going on inside of you, right, Dr. Yeah. Pompa? Well, look, I, I mean, ketosis is it's, uh, it's in fad right now, right, as well as fasting. Ketosis means that you're dropping your uh, carbohydrates uh, to under 50 grams a day, which what happens is that your cells can use two things for energy, sugar or fat. When you do that, it forces the cells to use fat, which is an amazing state. Genetically, again, we're programmed for these states. Here's the difference. When you look at ancient cultures, they don't stay in this state. They move in and out of it. Uh -huh. So to Dr. Duncan's point, right now it's so in vogue, everyone's just in ketosis all the time. Well, that's not what ancient cultures do. We move people in and out of the state to emulate what happens in ancient cultures. And when we get back from this break, that's what we're going to do. We're going to go through this process really quickly and get the basics and learn how we can, we, you and I, can manage our, the autophagy in our body and perhaps get our bodies to renew themselves by eating themselves. This is the food chain. What's eating what? Right back. Well, as promised, we're going to figure out how to go through this process um, of controlling and managing autophagy. I went through this process with Dr. Duncan McCollum's wellness class uh, one evening a week for seven weeks. And wow, it really is transformative. Um, and I have a lot to learn. So I guess it's, it's an ongoing process, right, Dr. Pompa? You just don't learn it all you keep learning as you go it's true just like every fast your body does something new and different in regards to healing you know fasting is like uh, the, this time you, you take a vacation and you have the honeydew list right things you wanted to get done for so long and fix around the house that you don't have time for right that's our bodies we're going day to day it's trying to survive it's using its energy just to get you through your day now Ah, you're on vacation. You go, okay, I have time and I have a little more energy. I'm going to go fix these things. That's what your body's doing in a state of fasting. All of a sudden, it has the time and energy. It takes so much energy to digest and process food that when you're not digesting and processing food, it goes, okay, what am I going to do with my extra newfound energy? It goes to healing. It eats the bad cells, creates the new cells. It, it, it's phenomenal. It renews. It does. It, it renews. renews so let's start with uh, week one in this process. What you do is you take us from um, eating sugar to eating fat. Yeah, we introduce what uh, Dr. Pop calls a two 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 diet, where you're going to be doing um, six tablespoons of different healthy oils a day, unlike the way your wife did it. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we all make mistakes. You know? <laughs> Instead of taking them all at once, you just spread them out through the day. Yeah, that's definitely <laughs> That'll make you go to the bathroom. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Did. And then, then the, the third one, or the fourth one, is the you know healthy salts, and usually Himalayan mm -hmm. salts. But we're actually kind of getting the body used to the fact that there is another type of fuel besides glucose. Mm -hmm. and, and the most famous thing you do is you introduce people to the bullet coffee, oh, bulletproof yeah. coffee, yeah. which consists of a big, huge fat pat of butter and some heavy duty whipping cream yeah uh all fats no sugars in there mm -hmm. and you pour the coffee over it and uh you drink that and you're not hungry that's right and you're just not hungry so you you, you fly through breakfast right yeah, and you know that was I remember the first seminar that you said we're not going to eat um, till lunch, and we're going to have you drink this coffee and check your glucose and ketones. And you know, I mean, everybody that starts a class, as you know, goes, I can't go without a meal. You know, and we're so driven around food. So the first part of the, the first few weeks is to get people to realize that it isn't about food. You know, it's about living healthy. You know, you know, I went and uh, the other day I went and opened up the refrigerator and I was standing there looking in the refrigerator. First thing I saw was that there wasn't much food in there. Hmm. And I was wondering, huh, not much food. And then, and then I thought, well, why am I even looking in the refrigerator? Because I'm not really hungry. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's, it is a transformative process shifting into that ketosis. Week number two, 
we do, we do we narrow our eating down to three full full keto keto friendly meals a day. Doctor Pampa. Yeah. Well, you know, just a little bit about week one. We we're okay. forced to be fat adapted, right? And and why is that important for the fast? Because when then when we're not eating, we're burning our own fat for energy. So week one, look at it as fat. We're fat adapting you. We're getting your body used to utilizing its fat, so you burn its own fat. So that's really important important before we go into a fast. Week two, um, we're preparing you for longer fasting states. So most Americans uh, eat on average 17 to 21 meals a day. I, I know you're saying that's impossible, but you know you walk past the you know the counter and you eat some nuts. That's a meal because it raises glucose and insulin. Uh, maybe you have a kombucha, healthy drink. That's a meal. Right? I mean, so the point is... is or a like, Milky Way bar <laughs> or a chocolate I, I shake. Was people, I was giving people the benefit of the doubt that they're eating healthy things. <laughs> but the point is this. If you, all studies show, if you want to live longer, you have to eat less. But when you look at ancient cultures, they're not pushing half their food away. They're eating less by eating less often, like the tribe that I saw. You know, they were eating this one meal in the afternoon, yeah, it lasted three hours, just like many of the European countries, but they eat less by eating less often. So we're preparing you for this by taking all of your snacks away and saying, hey, eat, just eat three meals. And so that's step one. And now what is it doing in between the meals? It's training your body, your cells to use fat instead of having to make you give cravings for sugar, because that's why cravings happen is it's making you get the craving, feed me, feed me, but we want your body to eat its fat. And, of course, you're eating, eating more fat during your regular meals, too. You're taking the bullet coffee, bulletproof coffee, so you're consuming the fats and your body's going. And, you know, fats burn differently than carbohydrates. I think of it as a difference between burning uh, some paper, some newspaper in the fireplace or burning, a, burning a, a lo- an oak log. You know, the oak log burns along and steady, and the, and the newspaper goes, poosh. Yeah. Well, you know, I'll even make it even uh, more clear. The log or the paper puts off a lot of smoke. That's the way glucose burns, and your cells have to deal with that smoke. When you make energy in your cell, you make waste. So one of the ways we control cellular inflammation, which is the key to fixing hormones, detoxing your cells, is controlling the inflammation by changing the energy it's using. So the dirty energy of uh, regular glucose, like the wood or the paper. However, we're switching to fat and ketones, which is like natural gas. You don't need a chimney, right? It burns that clean. That's one of the big things is we're switching the energy, which downregulates inflammation, makes you feel better. And it works. And the, 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 the fire burning in your body lasts longer it's cleaner. You don't have the spikes, boom, boom, up That's and right. down. Yeah, one of the main things I hear people say right off the bat is their brain fog's clearing up. You know, they're feeling better, more energy. Yeah. And what is brain fog? What? What is brain fog? <laughs> 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 that was it right there. He's laying for me on that one. You know it was coming. It's just walking into a room wondering why you went in there, you know, uh-huh. or kind of not right. thinking clearly and... You just feel like you're in a fog, right? And I'll, sometimes you don't even know it until it's listed. Like, holy cow, I've been in a fog. You know, it's like no wonder I can't remember what I read. No wonder I'm going through my day, you know, where, wondering where my things are, you know. Brain fog. There it is. And week four, um, we've restricted our eating. Oh, wait, week three. This week we week, week three? Week. There, that's brain fog. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was just going to say, okay, so. Yeah, you're just being funny, right? He did that on purpose. Okay. No doubt. Week three. Yeah, that's the intermittent fasting where we're fasting daily. For example, my time, it is 121, okay? I haven't eaten one meal yet. So the point is, is I'm fasting from my last meal, and I'm still fasting. Maybe I'll have a, a, a first meal around 3 o'clock. So that is an intermittent fast. So what we do here is we say, look, you pick an eating window that you like for your schedule. Maybe you like to eat in the morning, but you can pick an eating window anywhere from, say, four hours to eight, even ten hours. But you eat in that window, and we try to limit your meals to two meals, but if you have to squish all three into that eating window, fine. But we want to open up a fasting window. Why? Because we're getting you ready 
for the longer fast. We're forcing your cells to get used to using your fat for energy. We're forcing your cells to dip into the fat and get used to without food. So, in a, by the way, studies show after a 15-hour fast, you're getting some autophagy. So we're already getting the body used to eating its bad cells for energy and nutrition as well. So that's the importance of this. And then we want to shrink your eating window as time goes on. So, clever. Which leads us into week four now, <laughs> Dr. Duncan. Week four is where we're starting to actually um, skip, almost have one meal a day. So we're actually teaching the body even how to, deep, how to burn that deep fat stores even mm -hmm. more and more. So we're really getting it to know how to turn on that fat burner. I kind of think of it like sugar burns, like it's like an ATM card. You can get that immediately. But we are having to tap into our 401k account, and we, it takes work to do that. So it takes a while for us to get the body trained, and we do it one day at a time. And that 24-hour fast really makes a difference on that. So we're compressing and compressing and compressing. But we're not necessarily saying that when we do eat, we have to really starve ourselves, right? No, matter of fact, quite the opposite. We want to eat to full. Because if the body gets a hint that it's starving, it will slow its metabolism down to save its life. That's why caloric restriction doesn't work long term. So when we eat, we want to eat to full to tell the body it's not starving and to keep burning its fat and not holding on to it for another day. But he, here's the thing. It's like exercise. We don't just come out and, you know, you, those listening may not be able to exercise like I exercise, but if you do a little bit at a time, one day you will. So we're, we're, we're increasing the stress by, you know, basically squeezing in your eating window. And then by week four, we're making you go a day or two a week. You choose where you only eat one meal. And I call this feast, famine, cycling. We're emulating ancient tribes. Ah, but so we don't, the body doesn't think it's starving. We throw in at least one feast day a week because we know that this feast famine causes the body to go into adaptation, just like it was, does during exercise. In that adaptation, we see a hormone optimization, and we see your body get stronger, not weaker. It's no different than exercise. So think of week four as exercise with diet, feast famine cycles. There it is. And week five, same, well, th same thing, but more of, right? We take it to the next level because, again, like exercise, we don't want to just throw five-mile run at you, right? We want to increase it slowly. So week five, we take feast famine cycle to the next level, and we keep broadening the, uh, the famine cycle. We squish your eating window. We throw another fast day in a week, and we're taking <clears> – we're, we're – we're preparing you for what's coming next, and that's five days of fasting. So where do people – where's a good play, place for people to start? Well, look, you know, I say one day, meaning go 24 hours without a food, uh, without food. So, you know, I'll tell you the perfect time, um, and, and that's week four. <laughs> so we, we, week four, we go 24 hours without food. This is where you start. However – what we know now is, is years ago, clinically, we happened upon five days. Why? Because it takes about three days for the real good results to start and people to go, I actually feel better. That happens around three or four days. So we always said, okay, you have to go at least four days. However, one more extra day, once your body's fat adapted and you're seeing all of these you know, stem cells surging, go one extra day. So we always went five days. Now, new science shows five days just happens to be a magic number because you get the max autophagy day four and you get max stem cell production day five. So the first fast, I don't care if you're a beginner or, you know, or advanced, uh, we love a fat five-day fast. But that's the point here. We're preparing you for that to make it easy and to get the max amount of healing as you can. When people say five days without food, are you kidding me? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, you know, that's why the beauty of this whole seven-week cycle is because you go incrementally, and by the time you get up there, the people that are ready, and not everybody's ready at, at that point, mm -hmm. and that's why we just keep uh, allowing people to come back and back to the class, but most of the time you go, yeah, I'm just ready, and I don't really care for food right now anyway. Now, it really has a physical, it has a, a, an impact on a person's physical appearance hmm. when they go through a five-day fast, you can see it in them. 
They could see it in their face. Yeah, but I'll tell you one thing, and so you know, one or two weeks into, all you've done is change the food you eat, and you see the changes in the class. Absolutely. The faces get much leaner, much brighter skin. Their eyes are cleared up. And all they've done is, all we've done is change the food. We've stopped eating sugar. And it's Stopping amazing. Sugar, yeah. Then you get, and you know, I got to say, Michael, you were a little reticent on whether you were even going to do the course. I think your wife made you come in. Well, you drug me in. <laughs> yeah, and and, and you know, it's it's real. In, it was an interesting process on how I got involved. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you said, "Why don't you join me?" And I said, "Well, what the heck." Give it a try. And I drug my wife in. Oh, is that the way it so, went? I so said, you have to come with me or I'm not going. Uh, <laughs> but, I, 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 let me motivate people to why you want to fast. First of all, I believe our DNA is set up for it. We need fasting to turn off these bad genes that get triggered. That could be your autoimmune. That could be your food allergy. That could be uh, your diabetes, thyroid condition, weight loss um, resistance, obesity, whatever it is. So we need fasting to turn off those bad genes. We also need fasting for hormone optimization. Today, so many people have hormone dysfunction. They don't feel well, and it's hormones. But instead of taking hormones, which is sometimes necessary, why not fast? Because our bodies are designed to do it. We see this hormone optimization occur, right? With more people with the inability to lose weight, our bodies are designed to fast. We know that fasting states have such a hormone optimization that you can break through weight loss resistance. Listen, you know, I I, I can tell you this from my own experience. Once you fast, by day three, you'll say, oh my gosh, my hunger's gone. It's so much easier than I ever thought. Thomas Seyfried wrote a book. He's one of the premier cancer researchers right now in the country. And he says that one fast a year decreases your cancer rate over 90%. One fast. I mean, I can keep going of why you should fast, but it's not as hard as you think. And we also give people an option of what we call partial fast, which I think is actually harder than a pure water fast. But we, we do give an option for some people to do a partial fast. And that's another subject Dr. Duncan teaches. You know, he can explain the options of different fasts for you. But I'm telling you, fasting can change your life, and that is the reason you should jump into one of Dr. Duncan's classes. There you go. And thank you so much, Dr. Daniel Pompa, drpompa.com, Dr. Duncan McCollum. Yeah, it's the McCollum Family Chiropractic.com. And thank you all for tuning in, Food Chain Radio Program. My goodness, what fun. You've been listening to the award-winning Food Chain Radio Show with Michael Olson. And if your friends miss the show, tell them to log on the Food Chain page at MetroFarm.com for a listen. Now, go out and find some food with its farmer's face on it and live.